Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 25th, 2021, and this is the Weekend Charts. I'll be sure to thank all you guys and girls for being here live. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you too. Please subscribe, and if you like what you see, hit the like button, obviously, and if you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. I'm half kidding. All right, what do we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, I have some serious concerns, but it one thing that's kind of in the back of my head watching this market intraday, it's like it, it wants to roll over, but it just hasn't done that yet, and it, it keeps coming back. So we'll talk about that in one second. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them on the slides while we're on the slides. And then once we get to the charts, you can ask about anything you want. Also, hold off on your stock picks so I don't get lost. And that's for your benefit, obviously. But when we get to the live charts, feel free to put them in. And also, punch them in one at a time so I know which ones that I've cleaned, uh, we've talked about. So what are we talk about? Well, I want to continue my discussion on profit centers. And a little bit of uh, this week, I've got a couple of examples one with dance partners and one with Russian dolls or ogres. I guess they're kind of, each one's a bit of a combination of everything and that may, that'll that make more sense in just one second. One thing I've been wanting to talk about lately is boiling down trading psychology. And I've been wanting to do this for a while, but the market conditions and then other things have happened and it's just taken me a while to get around to getting back there. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So when it comes to trading psychology, and I guess before I get started, one thing I was thinking about right as I'm going live is I don't want you to think that I'm any different from you, okay? I have the same neurology. I have the same psychology, or we all have, or many of us have a shared psychology. And that was one of the epiphanies for me early on in being blessed and being able to to work with all these seasoned traders and i was amazed that they too were emotional and they weren't perfect in their execution and they made mistakes and they were human too it's it's so funny i, I remember one time i was uh helping kevin haggerty in new york uh, in a seminar and uh one of the guys that like the meet and the greet was like wow he's drinking a beer like he's he's you know they thought like these guys don't uh they don't they aren't human and it's like they were surprised to see that they're just a guy just like you and me and believe me we all have these emotions and i work closely with a lot of you guys and we all we all share the same psychology for the most part now i kind of vacillate between deep dives into psychology and even some neurology here and there. And there's some need to know things and there's some need to know things. For instance, the more you know about the neurology, because it's inescapable, inescapable, easy for me to say, we all have a brain that looks something like this little McLean's triune brain here. And part of all this way the brain works including like the lower level stuff being more reactionary and emotion that you can't control you have to embrace like I've, I've given speeches just on that but the other thing is which is kind of like the need to know thing is the emotional response for a loss is twice the emotional response for a gain and if you're not careful you could end up in a bit of a, a psychological downward spiral, even if you're doing okay, because the losses really, really get to you. And just, I can give you a case in point. Yesterday, I had a really, really great day. It just didn't feel fantastic, but it felt okay. And especially on the intraday stuff. And today I got absolutely creamed. And I'm in a bad way today. I just snapped at my wife and had to go apologize. By the way, the trading spills over to your life and the life spills over to your trading. And then that could be a, a dangerous negative feedback cycle too. But you see, I'm getting a little, I'm going to get back into the deep dive again. But the bottom line is there are some things you will need to know. And there's a lot of stuff that's neat to know. And I have to be careful because I'm such a nerd when I learn these little things. I just can't wait to rush and tell you. 
So I go through these deep dives into psychology and neurology, and then I come back to just do it. Just do it. Just plan your trade and trade your plan. You know, my work is done. I, I drop a mic, but I've I've broken a couple of mics doing that. I need to get a I need to get a cheap mic that I can throw around. <laughs> Now, the reason trading is so hard, and I've read this in other places too, but it's something that I could never wrap my head around. And I've seen a lot of other people talk about it too. I'm not the first person to think or or talk about this. But the reason trading is so hard is because on the surface, the concept is so easy. As I said in Trading Full Circle, the only way to profit from a trade, and that's any trade, okay, no matter what your methodology, is to capture a trend. And if you think about it, these little blips on the screen, these little digital blips, all you have to do is sell higher than you buy, okay, or cover your shorts, obviously lower than you shorted. And that's it. And it could be so damn tough. It's like, why is this often so elusive and, and when it works and when you're in a state of flow like i was in for most of this week today notwithstanding sometimes it does seem like it's just that easy but d never lose sight of the fact that the way you make money on a trade is to capture a trend and a trend means that you're obviously selling higher than you bought okay and your profit obviously is b minus a i mean duh but you'd be surprised at how many people fight trends and how many people seek to overcomplicate things by plotting 15 oscillators. Now, I know easier said than done, but again, you don't ever want to lose sight of this concept. What is our ultimate goal? We have to capture some blips with little digital blips on the screen, right? We got to figure that out. And that's how we get paid. There's no other way to get paid as a trader. And it, it just, it just, it's crazy because it could be so elusive. I was watching Limitless last night. I like that movie. It's kind of cool. I mean, I've kind of, I'm kind of into like these movies where they have like a wonder drug or something that makes you incredibly smart and stuff like that. Because I, I could use one. <laughs> You know, and he was going through all these details about the the stocks and what's going to make the stock rise and all these different reasons. It's like, eh. Probably not, okay? The bottom line is, if it's going up, it's going up, it's going down, it's going down. And seek to get on the markets that are going up and seek to get on the markets that are going down. As I've said before, I've told the story a thousand times. Greg Morris turned around when I said that. I said, this buy stuff goes up, sell stuff go down. That goes down. He said, he's got the right idea. Anyway, you have to fully accept your methodology and risk and execution of that methodology. And that's that's a big one, okay? You have to accept, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this when we walk through the, the, the process, the simplified process, but you really have to accept the risk in going into a trade. I was talking with someone yesterday and I could tell from the conversation that he, wasn't really or he hasn't fully wrapped his head around being able to go through a drawdown if his position stop out and guess what if all my positions stopped out i'm going to be pissed off i'll probably go yell at my wife and be in a doghouse for a while <laughs> what's he all saying man who spent too much in too much time in doghouse end up in cat house <laughs> so you have to believe and have confidence in what you do and that's a biggie. Now, here's the good news. It's very cheap to learn, paper trade. So take one of my patterns, or it doesn't have to be my pattern. I'm not the grand pumba, right? But take something like bow ties, and the market's kind of rolling over right now, or at least certain areas of it. Go in and study an S-ton of bow ties if you're not already convinced that the bow tie is a, a good pattern. Go in and look at the service archives, and look, you know, I, I, I did the heavy lifting for you, okay? I found a uh, ton of these things over the last 10 or 50 years, however many archives are out there. Go in and look at as many of those as you can stand, okay? And that's the best that I could find. Maybe you could find even better. 
but it's very cheap to learn and to gain confidence in what you do. As I said before, and I've been guilty in the past too, so I'm not I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, but years ago I was friendly with someone and, and they told me, yeah, I'm doing this little thing. And they, they kind of explained to me and I said, that's neat. You know, how, how well does it work? Uh, how profitable is it? And, and uh, he's like, I don't know. It's the first one I've done. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, when'd you learn this? He's like, oh, I read it this morning. It's like, eh, he hasn't really fully developed confidence in the method. And act, the worst thing that could happen to him would be instant success with that. And I see a lot of these little phone traders and my daughter keeps telling me stories. My younger daughter, she's still in college, but she keeps telling me stories of all of these, her friends and how much money they're making. And, you know, I'm kind of like, well, that'll work until they don't. And they'll have a really hard lesson in trading psychology. Now, you can paper trade all you want. As I said before, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. Somebody pointed out to me that maybe now with trading simulations, I might at some point meet a an unsuccessful paper trader. But I'd be willing to bet that there'd be, there, there's not going to be a whole lot of them because they're not putting their hard-earned money on the line. So eventually, you have to get your reps in. Now, one thing I added last minute is keep your size small and you will be amazed that it would what a good trader you are. Recently with these profit centers, I've been going in and trading at a smaller size. And I'm gonna show you like the last week's trade with Lab D in a few minutes. And it was at a fairly small size based on a roughly a 100K account. I have one active account where I do a lot of the model trades and the model trades come directly from the service. And then I'm here all day anyway, and I'll do a lot of the uh, the intraday stuff and the profit center stuff. And then I have other accounts, IRA and some other things that I'll do other things in, mostly the core methodology and occasionally some of these profit centers. But as I've said before, I was amazed a while back, a few weeks back, when where I just kind of went down to my share size working on these profit centers. And I had one of the best trading days in a long, long time, especially on an intraday basis. And my share size was really small. You could make a lot of money trading a few hundred shares. The other thing I would encourage you to do is, by the way, if you, let me just get back to share size. If your share size is so small, it's almost meaningless, then you can follow the plan. It's only when you get a little bit outside of where you should be trading that it becomes harder and harder to follow that plan. Now, the other thing I'm gonna encourage you to do is document, document, and document. And it's hard, it's hard to keep up with, believe me. In fact, post-COVID, my, my, my motivation for certain things, my motivation for trading, my motivation for profit centers, my motivation for crypto and, and shite coins and all that other stuff is just through the roof. But my motivation to do the grunt stuff, like document my trades and uh, you know, make sure the website is updated properly for the webinar tonight, make sure I have a webinar scheduled for tonight and all that. I don't mind doing the webinar itself and all, but just a, a lot of the grunt work I've kind of lost interest in. And I think it's a bit of a, the COVID fog or whatever this stupid disease does. And it's a pretty stupid disease. <laughs> but I've been a little lax because during COVID, I didn't update this little emotional tracking sheet. And I will I could get you guys a bigger picture of this, but basically, obviously, the date shame would be a rating I give myself based on some shame things that I did. I'm probably going to give myself a pretty high rating for that today. My energy, if you think about it, trading is really a management of energy, and that's something that I'd like to flesh out in a lot more detail and it's like there are days like today when things don't go well and it just it just takes a piss out of me and it really it really it just wipes you out and the other thing about the management of energy and it's something again I need to really flesh out but I'm so busy sometimes dealing with some of these these bad trades or trades where I might have went in a little too big or got a little full of myself or got a little, got in a little earlier you know, one of the things or two of the things or 10 of the things I tell you not to do, you know, I'm human too. And I have those same emotions and I do those bad things. The, the, the From a selfish standpoint, two things on the educational side. One, I see a lot of bad trading out there 
which reminds me, hey, don't do that. And number two, as far as like the service is concerned, those trades are pretty easy because I actually plan out that entire trade. I show you the plan. And it's like, if I'm going to show you my plan, I'm going to follow that plan too. So that's pretty easy from a selfish standpoint. That kind of self-serves me. But when you start doing some of this other stuff, that's where like the shame trades come in. And that really zaps your energy. And by the way, it could be, and we're gonna, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself, imagine that. But when we get to the energy things, there may be things that you do that might be profitable, but absolutely zap your energy. And I'll flesh that out in a few, few minutes. Risk management, very important. How's your risk management process? Obviously following the process. Anything, that, anything that's not trend following moron, in other words, the core methodology, ego, that's a big one, okay? My biggest losses come after my biggest gains. I had one on my, I had probably my biggest day yesterday. I had my worst day today as far as ancillary trading, as far as, as profit centers are concerned. And I've got to watch that. My biggest loss is used, like if I fly around the world, back pre-COVID at least, last time I, I went out, it happened. I went to San Francisco and it happened. But Usually, if I'm flying somewhere around the world, speaking a good gospel of trading, and people are like, hey, Dave, like your stuff, you're great, yay, I'll come home and I'll immediately just have one of the shittiest days ever <laughs> because my ego is too hard. I'm probably also a little tired, and that's where management of the energy comes in. I'm hoping that longer term, I'll be able to look at this spreadsheet and see what I'm doing. But anyway, ego... FOMO, obviously, happiness, I think that's another important thing. Not sure because like on Friday, I had a bunch of options expiring and I got myself into, I guess you'd call it a bit of a pickle and it's kind of like, do I gamma scalp against these positions? Do I let them play out? Do I let them expire? Oh my goodness, I don't want to get executed or do I want to get executed? It's like all this stuff. And if you're feeling some sort of stress or uh, tightness in your shoulders at all, it's like today I had a lot of tightness in my shoulders. Yesterday I was relaxed, okay? It's amazing if I could get into a state of flow and I'm in, in sync with the markets, it's like trading is actually a relaxing, fun thing to do. But if, if the markets are choppy and I'm fighting it or if I'm trying to make something happen, then it can get a little dangerous. Now, closed P&L, and I really intend to spend a whole lot of time on this, but now that it's down here, just wanted to let you know what it is. Peter Brandt, and this, this spreadsheet was inspired by Peter Brandt. Peter Brandt in Unknown Market Wizards talked about he only counts his closed equity as his. And that's kind of helped me to see things in a little bit different light. Since then, I've been a little bit more inclined to peel off a few shares in these stocks that are doing really, 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 really well. You know, we've got in one of them at seven and now it's 30 something now. So I peeled off quite a few of those shares. Okay. I still have a sizable position on. I've done that a little bit to, to help that closed equity go up. I I think long and hard, like this morning, where one where, place where I fudged up, I kind of got, I'm not going to say goaded into a trade, but I took a trade I wasn't intended on taking because one of my clients was talking about it. And um, I have a bad habit. If I, if I know a client's going to take the trade, I, I tend to take it too. <laughs> but it was something I would normally do, but I, but I was instantly up a bunch and I said, man, this market's choppy. I should, I should take those profits, put that in my closed trading account. You know, I'm working on paying for some home improvements around here, you know? And that would go towards that that closed equity, you know. So, but instead, I, I I let it evaporate or I tried to push the issue or whatever. Index other would be like if other than like if I'm trading an IRA or something, SQQQ or socks, not socks, um, spiders and things like that. Other day trades, ogres, rabbits would be something that I really shouldn't do a whole lot of, and that's these wild and crazy stocks that are kind of just going crazy. Last year, I did incredibly well chasing rabbits, and then that will work until it don't, and I kind of screwed up, and that was a presentation I did a while back. So anyway, we add up the intraday profits. Uh, closed crypto, I haven't been keeping up with too well lately just because there's so many trades going on. 
closed stock trades, obviously option transactions. By the way, if I buy an option and that option is $2 and I buy five of them, so it's what, a thousand bucks, I immediately write that loss off and then I only put that money back into my account, so to speak, when I exit the position. And I think if you're not going to use stops, long options might be an option for you. Okay. Anyway, total close, uh, day change estimate, because this changes with certain platforms that are tracking the after hours. Questions is questions. My uh, nephew, when he was younger, he called a question a question, and that's where kind of a whole family uses the word question now. But I, I kind of like it because it has the word crest in it, quest, like you're going on a quest to learn, to get better. Speaking of getting better, next column, obviously getting better, and then notes. And then, by the way, on all of these, like if I take an ogre trade, I'll add a little note next to it, talk about what it was and how it, whether it worked or not, or just some, some little notes. And it's like document, document, document. The other thing I do, and I don't know if there's anything that's you should, well, I probably shouldn't hold it up because God knows what I wrote about this morning. But I write three pages every morning. That comes from the artist's way. I might have it here. By uh, Ju Julia Cameron. And I don't know if that's, I can't see the camera. Let's see. And that's on my www.davelander.com books-2-read. I would recommend you you read this book. Well, actually, I've only gotten a few pages into it. And she said to do the morning pages. And I haven't gotten around to finishing it, but I need to. Anyway, every morning I get up, first thing I do is I write three handwritten pages. I have a client right now struggling a little bit, don't we all, right? And I keep telling him to write three pages every morning, every morning, every morning. And I really think that if he did, I think that would a lot of his problems would be solved, at least from a trading perspective. And, and in other ways, too, because I think that you'd be surprised that, for instance, for me, if I'm worried about something that goes on the pages and I find I worry a little bit less about it if I wrote, wrote it down, it's like, okay, I wrote that down. I sleep better at night because like, okay, well, I made notes about that this morning. But what's amazing is, and I haven't gone back in a while, I'm probably a year behind, but if you go back and reread these things six weeks or six months from now, you're going to find out that the things you were worried about, 90% of them never happened. 5% of them were nowhere nearly as bad as you thought they would be. And then the other 5%, yeah, it sucked, but you dealt with it and you lived through it. And, you know, it's one of those Nietzsche things. It didn't destroy you. It makes you a little stronger. <laughs> What's his name? Norm, McDon Norm McDonald? What doesn't destroy me makes me very, very weak. So I can't emphasize enough, document, document, document. If you are documenting things, you can't sweep bad trading behavior under the rug. Now, one, one column I forgot to mention here was cryptocystis, okay? Uh, I've done a lot of trading in uh, Riot and Mara lately because I've got a feel for them based on the feel for crypto. And I haven't been as good, excuse me, I haven't been as good with those lately as I was in the past, so I really backed off. And another thing that had me backing off was, before I began to document these things, is I thought I was doing really well. And I showed one client my screen with all the buys and sells, and I thought he was kind of calling me out, but he was actually just kind of curious himself because he trades the same stock in and out with me a lot of times. And he's like, how much money are you really making? And, and that, like I said last week or week before, text loses tonality. And I was thinking that he was kind of calling me out like, hey, are you really making money on that? You know, come on. And I downloaded all the trades. And in downloading all the trades, I was profitable. And if there was a way to consistently be that profitable for every month of the year, yeah, it would be fine. But I was a little shocked at how little the profits were now again if i knew i could could make that every month or on average you know add an extra five hundred dollars a thousand dollars a month to my account but i really thought i was making a lot more than i was and that's where documenting trades come in and you can't sweep those bad trades under the rug 
if you are documenting them. Now, I kind of hate to say this, but I mean, we gotta have a little fun every now and then. So I think the occasional lottery ticket is okay, as long as you recognize it as such and document that too. Every now and then, if I'm having a really good day or things are going really well, I might get a wild hair and buy, I don't know, 100 or 200 out of the money options on something short dated, and take a bit of a lottery ticket approach. And it, I think that's okay as long as you, and, and I know you can't get a little bit pregnant, I, I get it, but I think it's okay as long as you recognize that as such and you document that too. Years ago, I was part of a hedge fund, and if we were having a really, really good month, we would take like a half a percent or whatever, and we would play the lottery, so to speak. And if that lottery paid off, our, our returns went up an extra percent, 2%, 3% for that month. If the lottery ticket didn't pay off, then we could kind of sweep it under the rug. So the occasional lottery ticket, for me, that means buying some some out of the money options near expiration on something that I think could possibly, especially on the short side, but something I think could possibly implode. 99% of the time, those will expire worthless. But if you want to see if it really works, I suggest you go in and short <laughs> an S ton of options and see how long that works because sooner or later you will blow up. Well, the blow up part, I'm going to be on the other side of the blow up and that's when it pays off, but not that often, okay? Now, here's the thing. If something is not profitable, barely profitable, and causes you a lot of stress, get rid of it. And that's the Myra thing. And my Myra trading, today notwithstanding, has become a lot more selective. But today, it looked like crypto, especially Bitcoin, was getting ready to rally out of a pullback. So I did have a little feel for that going on. Myra kind of reversed overnight. So I thought it was okay to go in on Myra. But after looking at... And again, I didn't have, I wasn't tracking these cryptos closely. The crypto sisters, Myra and Riot, I wasn't tracking them closely. And at the time, and when I downloaded the trades, I was a little bit stressed out. And I was looking in with uh, like the Lab D and Lab U. I downloaded those, and fortunately, and fortunately, those actually worked out pretty good, especially the Lab D. So that makes me feel pretty good about that trading. Now I know that that trading, and we talk about it in one second. I'll show you some examples, but I know that's going to come to an end too. But if anything is not profitable or barely profitable and causes a lot of stress, get rid of it. Getting a little further ahead of myself, but I, for several weeks, I made a lot of money on GME. It's way outside the methodology. It's almost shame if you think about it like that. But what I was doing was gamma scalping. I'd buy puts and then I would go long the stock against the puts because if you're going to try to trade GME, you need to use like a 30 point stop. You're kidding yourself. If you try to use anything less. Well, every week for quite a few weeks, it worked really well until it didn't. It kind of reminded me of as off the breach, that'll work until it don't. And then when it didn't work a couple of weeks back, I, as I said previously, I had a knot in my back and my neck was all tight and I'm all tensed up. And I'm like, is it really is it really worth my trouble? And even on the days where it did work, was it worth sort of it sort of ruined my week because I would I would start on Wednesdays, get in the options, and then gamut scalp against them. And you know, this thing moves 20, 30 points in a pop, sometimes 100 points in a pop. And all kidding aside, like I'd put in orders 100 points higher than what I buy in to to flip out for half of the shares, or 100 points lower, whatever the case may be. But I came to the realization that it was killing me, okay? And it took one really bad day to kind of come to that realization. So if something is not profitable, you have to think about it. And if it's barely profitable, you also have to think about it too. And even if it is profitable, as we'll see in one second, we talk about the, the profit centers, but it's causing you a lot of stress and it's affecting your lifestyle, then you might want to think about getting rid of it. So something is profitable because it's a tremendous amount of stress, you have to eliminate it. And that was, for me, that was GME. For someone I know, he's actually really good at scalping, but scalping causes a lot of stress in his life. 
he's a successful entrepreneur. He's also a doctor. He's got a lot going on. He should not be scalping. Okay. So let's look at the just do it process. First thing you do is you have to accept the trade. Now, to accept the trade, you need to do a pre-mortem. I, I preach about the post-mortem, and once again, I'm going to beat that dead horse in a few minutes. But you really have to do a pre-mortem, and I'm going to get to this further in the presentation, but is this really the great trade you think it is, okay? Have you really accepted the risk for the trade? And as Mark Douglas says, the late, great Mark Douglas, and I talked about this a few weeks back, if you can put on a trade without hesitation, take it off without emotional discomfort, you have accepted the risk. Amen, my brother from another mother. Now, once you accept the trade, you need to be flippant in your execution. Just, just not care. There's certain trades that I take where I immediately put in the orders and then I go about my life. And you have to not really care about what you're doing. So Douglas, when he talks about fear, and, and I've done a lot of presentations, he says essentially what you fear is not the markets. And I've done quite a few presentations where I went through some old commodities and I found that there was a, a cocoa bear market a few years back and cocoa halved. And for a commodity to half, that's a pretty big deal. And, and in presentations, I asked people, you know, raise your hands. How many people were stressed out about this cocoa bear market? Well, not one person so far has raised their hand. I'm sure at some point in time I meet a cocoa trader. I tried trading cocoa years ago. It's an exercise in futility, but that's another story. But the reason that there, nobody raised their hand was because nobody was trading cocoa. There's not a whole lot of cocoa traders out there. It's probably what makes trading cocoa so damn hard. There's not enough people, not enough active participants. And I guess some big, uh, what do you call them? Not the professionals, but the, whoever buys and sells it for the actual company or whatever come in. Commercials. It's been so long since I had all my CTA stuff. <laughs> Anyway, essentially what you fear is not the markets, but rather inability to do what you need to do, what you need to do it without hesitation. So a bear market of cocoa didn't bother anyone, right? But if you were you were long cocoa and that position was going against you, then you might experience some fear unless you know that you're gonna do what you have to do without hesitation. Whenever I don't have an actual stop in the market, especially like on an intraday trade, because on, on the position trades, I usually don't keep stops. So usually I do that with alerts. But if I don't have a natural stop in the market, I do kind of fear, uh, feel that fear that Douglas is talking about. I start thinking to myself, what if it blows through the lows? What am I going to do? Will I still be able to get out? Will I get out? You know, Will it become the deer and the headlights? And then if I put an actual stop and I get stopped out, then I just, you know, drop an F bomb. This thing is loud. <laughs> I want to drop it on my foot. I've quoted Larry Williams on this a thousand times, but it makes so much sense and it just dovetails right into what I'm talking about here. To make money as a trader, you have to not care. That that's that flip it thing. I'm I keep trying to wrap my head around and explain. You know, for some reason I'm having a hard time explaining that. But Larry says it right there. You just have to not care. As soon as you start caring, you have emotional attachment. Now, in some of these little, like the like the E-minis and like Lab D or whatever, I could care less about these. I have no attachment to these stocks or markets. I just want to try to grab a piece intraday whenever I think it's worth going in and try to grab a piece. By the way, E-minis, horrible way to try to make money. Uh, I have not been successful enough to teach it. I can tell you that right now. A while back, client was asking me a bunch of questions about E-minis, and I, th I think he thought I was being aloof. It's like tough market, really tough market. But anyway, you have to, to make money as a trader, you have to not care. As soon as you start caring, you have emotional attachment. Now, the clinical psychologists call this, what word do they use for that? I have a little COVID brain going on uh detached something detached i can't think of it 
right now. But you have to be uh, clinically dispassionate, I think might be the word I'm looking for, the phrase I'm looking for. You can't have a client come in and, and let them dump their problems on you. And then all of a sudden you get emotionally involved in their life because you're no longer an objective person. So you you have to have that dispassionate view when it comes to markets. I hope I'm using the right term. I actually had a slide with that in here and I took it out with last minute. The more you care, it's it's counterintuitive. The more you care, the less you make. Okay. Today I cared a lot. Today I didn't make a lot. I didn't make anything. Okay. I lost a lot. The more that, you know, there's the word I'm looking for. The more you're clinically dispassionate, okay, the more you're kind of detached, okay, and less detached to your trades, the more you will make. It's really quite simple, but hard to accept. Thank you for letting me work through that. Yeah, there's, there's like a fog with this COVID. It's, it's getting better though every day. So you have to have, you have to be a little flippant or quite flippant of your execution. And then you need to have a tempered or measured reaction. Now, we're all human. I drop a lot of F-bombs. I, I insulated my office. I did a crappy job because the my wife's, I'm, I'm in a separate, I'm in an attached structure, structure with a separate entrance. The only way in and out is one door right here. And, you know, the house is over there down on the porch. But anyway, she can hear me in her in her in the bathroom as clear as day <laughs> so uh my i had a separate structure at the at the old place and that made it kind of nice but anyway your reaction needs to be tempered or at least measured and you know if you look like this guy here as i often do then it's not a tempered or measured response it's kind of like the boating meme you know you're doing it wrong if you get really bored google some of these you're doing it wrong and i i just love those things so one of the most important things to do, obviously, as I said a thousand times, is the post-mortem. And you got to figure out how to separate luck from skill. Annie Duke wrote a book called Thinking in Bets. I thought it was a great book, except that I I wanted I wanted more, I wanted more answers. And I think some of her answers were you get a partner and things like that. And yeah, that's great, okay, and hold each other accountable. That's fantastic. But not all of us have that that kind of luxury, you know, and, and maybe that's where the Facebook group as it matures will be able to do more of those things. But if you're really to really willing to do a lot of introspection and if you document, 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 document and make sure you're documenting those emotions as much as you can, get your trading journal, write it down. What I'd like to do, but I know I'll never get around to listening to it. I have a little record around here somewhere. I can't find it. I'll just probably have to go buy another one. But I like to record every day what I'm thinking, what I'm doing. And I think that would be a wonderful exercise, especially if you get a, if like transcribe it every day. So that plus the morning pages, I think, would really be a godsend if you're willing to do that. And it's hard. It's hard being really honest with yourself. And that's that's one of the problems with this business is you can't blame stuff on anyone else. Anyway, you got to figure out how to separate luck from skill. And we all tend to congratulate ourselves and feel like it's skill when we make money on a trade. And we all tend to blame a bad trade on bad luck. Sometimes a bad trade is just bad trading. And that's where you come back to complete the cycle. Go in and look at your trade. At, did you do the right thing? If so, pat yourself on the back, regardless of the outcome. All right. Now, we're going to get to another secret to trading. And this is a biggie. Time travel. <laughs> when I did the Thinking Full Circle course, I had two thoughts in mind. What would a beginner need to know, assuming that they didn't know anything? I wanted a course where I can go in and explain why I use technical analysis and how I use technical analysis. And start with a bar chart, build a bar chart, explain how you're reading the psychology of the market. And as I began working on the course, I thought of another thing that was real important 
is what someone much more seasoned may what someone much more seasoned may loss may have lost sight of okay plotting that 15th oscillator forgetting that all you do have to do all you have to do is capture a little blip in the move of the chart so my thinking was what would i go back and tell that young punk version of me and it would be things like don't chase holy grails although the holy grail hunt it took many years of holy grail hunting to make me realize that there was no holy grail and that i should keep it simple but i could save you a lot of time and money by just telling you that I, as as you guys know in the facebook group i recently packed up nearly all of my books and shipped them off you know to you guys because i've been through all those things i've tried all those things and now i've settled upon just a few simple things that i've been preaching actually for the last 20 years as one of you guys pointed out found a forum that I was 20 something years ago I was talking about bow ties so it makes me feel good now my daughter my older daughter she's 26 and she used to work in New Orleans and she got transferred she got a promotion and she got transferred over here which is about for her it's about a 35 minute commute so there are some nights where she stays here depends on what's going on if she's working with a trainer or whatever tonight for instance she'll be here in a few minutes and you know in in attempt to kind of bond with her we're like okay what are you watching what are you into let's let's watch something together and she was watching queen of uh, the south and i'm kind of a fan of these drug movies or drug series or whatever the only problem is they always end badly and then after a while it gets so violent and i'm like why am i watching this why am i putting this negativity in my life but i always kind of get sucked in at first one thing i liked especially in the in the earlier episodes was the future Teresa, okay, and I'm not I'm not really, you know, spoiler alert, it's no big deal. I'm not giving anything away here. But the future Teresa, who's a drug lord, would give advice to the young, scared Teresa. And I'm a big fan of that, like the time travel thing. And if like if if your older self could come back and talk to your younger self, and this was kind of like an ongoing thing when I did the trading full circle. It was more of a one-time thing, like, hey, I get one shot. I can't, I can't tell him where the Dow's gonna be or the P's are gonna be or whatever, or buy as much Bitcoin as you can at 25 cents, <laughs> you know, or just buy ten dollars or ten dollars at 25 cents. What would that be? It'd be 40 Bitcoins, which would be worth a lot, a shit ton. Anyway, the the premise with the trading full circle was what could I go back and tell him without giving away any any secrets, so to speak, or any, any type of, of future predictions? And it would be to keep it simple and don't grail hunt. Well, Teresa, with young Teresa, has like an ongoing thing. And, and I'm kind of a big fan of that. And one thing I've been thinking about lately is what would future Dave tell present Dave, okay? and along those lines obviously you can't time travel but you can predict the future in at least one way and i'm i'm a victim of that today and that's why i'm kind of crotchety tonight you know you could predict the future in one way by asking yourself is present dave going to make future dave mad is present laurent going to make future laurent mad is present zach going to make future zach mad and all you other guys and girls in here I feel like I'm in rocker room. I see Zach, I see John, I see Chris. So you got to ask yourself, is present Dave going to make future Dave mad? So when I was up big in, in the Crypto Sisters earlier this morning, and I, I got cute and tried to do some option stuff, and then I fat fingered an order and I fudged up, you know, before I did all that, I had like a really good profit really quick. I didn't intend to take the trade. Again, not that I was goaded into it, but somebody was talking about them and we were looking at them and it's like, oh, you know what? I'll jump in with you. But I remember thinking, you know, that's a lot of money really quick. Just take it. That's not what your intent was for today. This is free money. You could put some money into your backyard project, put some money into the pool, the outdoor kitchen, whatever. You could buy a grill with that money, you know? And I find myself thinking, okay, that would make future Dave happy. 
but I didn't calculate what would happen if I fudged up and how that would make future Dave mad, okay? So going into a trade, especially like something I won't do anymore, which you know, I say I won't do, let's see, but going into a, a, a gamma scalping situation in GME, I have the potential to make future Dave really pissed off at me, okay? <laughs> so it's a little strange way of thinking, but I think that if you could wrap your head around that, how are you gonna feel at the end of the day? How are you gonna feel at the end of the month when you shoot from the hip with an unplanned trade or if you put on too many shares or if you try to get cute and outsmart the market? And by the way, you know, getting back to that, you're doing it wrong, okay? When my and I said this earlier, but when a while back, I, I, in one of the presentations, I had this knot reappear in my back. And I had that knot, as I said years ago, without going through the whole story, I was in a shitty job, a soul crushing job. And this knot appeared in my back and I thought it was a tumor. It's not a tumor, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, it's like a tumor back there or something. And it's just come to find out, I just needed to lighten up, Francis, you know? But that reappeared a while back. That that pain in my shoulders reappeared today when I was doing those things. And guess what? Present Dave made future Dave mad. Present Dave made future Dave raise his voice earlier at his wife. And that makes his wife mad at future Dave. And so future Dave is mad at present Dave. Or that's getting confusing, but I think you get the idea. So is your present is is your action going to make your future self mad? And by the way, <laughs> this applies in life, okay? <laughs> you know, will that extra beer or six make your future self angry in the morning? Probably so. All right, let's shift gears here and get the profit centers. Hopefully, I didn't go too far off the deep end on the trading psychology. As I said last week, profit centers are ancillary profitable techniques. Profit will be the keyword in that sentence. Ideally non-correlated to the core methodology. And believe me, I, I've, I've been having some, some deep dive type of conversations with some of you guys. And when you look at some of these positions that have gone from $7 to $37 or whatever the case may be, 500% at least at the peak, and we're kind of noodling and questioning whether or not some of this ancillary trading is worthwhile. Well, this is my life, okay? This is what I do. So I'm really into all this ancillary things, but I have to be careful and not get too full of myself. And then, you know, for instance, trading some of these markets that are causing me tremendous amount of stress, is it really worth it? And again, it's an energy management thing, okay? So be careful if if it is 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 hurting your life or hurting your other trading or something. And I'm gonna flesh that out in a few seconds. But ideally, non-correlated to the core methodology or in non-correlated markets. Now, I want to flesh out a lot more of the negatives here. I don't want to just it, it, the thing is, I'm excited about profit centers, and some of you guys really shared in the enthusiasm. And I, I just want to kind of tap the brakes for myself and for you a little bit, even though I'm still pretty excited about all this. You just have to remember there there are some downsides to it. One downside, I don't know if I have it in tonight. The upside, if there's something you're doing intraday, like a leverage share trade or something when the time is right, which I'll show you in just one second, or an ogre or a, a Russian doll type of thing. So at the end of the day, if you made money, that money is yours forever. On the flip side, if you lost money, you have lost that money forever. With the core methodology, let's say you're in something like CPE. It got whacked the other day. You come in and you're down a couple thousand dollars on the position. But by the end of the day, it ended positive or the next day it went up like five points or whatever. All that money came back. It doesn't always come back, okay? It's sooner or later, you're gonna get stopped out and it happens. But that's all part of playing the game. That's all part of playing the methodology. But with the core methodology, with the longer term trend following, after you have established a position from the swing trade, the free position or the free rolling, so to speak, that money has a good chance of coming back if the market just corrects and then turns around and goes right back up. If you lose money in a day trade, that money is gone forever. So that's one of the downsides. Now, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, okay? 
I have a guy I pick on a lot. We're pretty close. He likes to listen to shows because he likes to. He, he wants me to start paying him for material. You know, he's. I think he's half kidding. Uh because I get so much material from it. But he could scout. But he has no business scalping given his his schedule. But he's a really good scalper. And if he scalps and makes money, he has a good day the rest of the day. If he scalps and loses money, it he, that stress kind of carries with him. And then on his lunch break or every chance he gets, he goes back and works. And a lot of times gets the money back. But you could see where this could end badly. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, okay? Guilty. Just because I can gamma scalp game puts against call uh, against a long stock doesn't mean I should. So you have to identify whether or not that's that's zapping your energy and possibly, and that's the, the where I'm going with that too, is if the ancillary trading, if the profit center, one particular one or one in particular or whatever, but if profit centers are taking away from your trading, if you miss a trading signal, and I've been guilty too, it's like uh, I'll somebody will will email me and ask me a question about a position that just triggered or whatever. And I'm like, holy crap, I was so busy doing some of these other things that I didn't even pay attention to my own core methodology. So you've got to be careful not to get pulled in a different direction too much. Now, even when the music appears to be playing, don't fall in love with your dance partner. And I've seen people do this quite a bit. I was talking about the, the scalper earlier. He was absolutely printing money in Boeing when the when the COVID thing was kind of like really blowing up early on. You know, we're all going to die. We'll never be able to fly on a plane again. And, you know, I was a little freaked out about it all too. And rightfully so, now that I had COVID. Holy shit. But that's another story altogether. <laughs> Nearly died. I thought I was going to die at least. But as he said, and this is not the first time he's he or any other body, any person said it, and I've said this before too, but it was working so well. Well, the problem that I think happened is that volatility began to implode, and he was capitalized on that on a extreme volume and extreme volatility. And when that dried up, the scalping wasn't as good. Now Another, the flip side of that is something I thought about after I put that first uh, point in there is that you got to be careful, especially when the music is playing, don't press a front run. Today, I got a little full of myself. I had a huge day yesterday and I was feeling pretty good today and I wanted to have another one of those days today because it felt good. And I may have gotten in a little early. I may have put on too many shares. I may have made a lot of mistakes that I often preach against, okay? Such as front running or, as I just said, over leveraging. So you got to be really, really careful because you can fall in love with a certain style of trading or one of these profit centers or a dance partner or something like lab d has just been doing exceptionally well for me and i've, I've got this affinity for it now i've got to be careful i don't get in trouble with that success that's what I, that's the one i got burned on today but yeah that's that's another one that i've been doing really well with today notwithstanding so what i would recommend you do is have a chair ready for when the music stops and if you're tracking each profit center carefully you don't know where that music stops. Well, if you're scalping Boeing, okay, and you're making money, making money, making money, making money, making money, then you make some, lose some, make some, lose some, make some, lose some. Well, if you're not carefully tracking that every day in a spreadsheet, you might not realize that on the net net, you're not doing that well. Like I said earlier, not to beat a dead horse, but when I looked at the Myra trades, you know, it's like, well, how profitable are you? It's like, well, let me see. You're like, holy crap. I if not as profitable as I thought I was on that, you know? And it's still a point where it's like a few bad trades could wipe out a month's worth of trading. And it's like, are all those trades really worth it? So you have to really look within. And the easiest way to do that is, is just do it on a more of a quantitative basis by putting those numbers in every day. Now, the downside of profit centers, like today, again, I had a bad day, I've been had a bad day, right? 
is sometimes they can add insult to injury. Well, my, my core methodology did okay today, so it kind of broke even, at least as far as a date equity goes. So I really didn't lose that much money today, but I lost the money nonetheless. And let's say that you have a bad day on a day trade, okay, on intraday trades, I should say, and you have a bad day in the core methodology, which is normal, okay, it happens, right? Then it kind of adds insult to that injury. And like I said earlier, we're really in in the energy management business. We have to manage our own energy. What creates energy and what zaps your energy? Well, create energy that's created for me is going in and finding an ogre and uh, a Russian doll or maybe a combination of both, especially if it's in my Landry list, like I'll show you in one second. That makes me feel good. And that sort of creates energy and gets me excited. What zaps my energy is when I'm shooting from the hip, taking an unplanned trade, over leveraging and all the bad behavior. I think of a minute two tonight. So again, dance partners or stocks that you kind of have a feel for. Don't fall in love with your partner. He or she will eventually leave you because something will change. Okay. Again, make sure you have a chair ready when the music stops. Track, track, and track them. Have I said that yet tonight? And I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, but they might not be as great as you think. The other thing you need to do is know why they're working, okay? Know that the volatility was absolutely insane when you're scalping Boeing and a bunch of other these big cap stocks, okay? And you're printing money. So like right now, biotech and the semis appear to be have topped and the volatility is increasing and and you're not only getting the rollover but you're getting these sharp retraces back up so i'm trying not to play both ends against the middle but some days i think today i actually made money on lab u and lost money on on lab d even though i'm bearish it's like years ago i worked with a with a trader who was well seasoned <laughs> i guess that sounds kind of weird but anyway he was the bearish guy I knew. He would fax me all this stuff and he would, all this arcane stuff and all this crazy stuff. I mean, you name it, he was into it. And he was the biggest bear on earth. And after a month or so of this, I finally asked him, it's like, well, you seem to be so damn bearish, but you got a, a boatload of stocks you're long. Why are you long so many stocks if you're so bearish? It's like, well, the market's going up. <laughs> So I thought that was a good way of looking at things. And it's kind of like, I'm super bearish, but if these things are rallying intraday, it's like like one of my clients said today, you can't beat them, join them. Just be careful not to try to play both ends against the middle. We did have one day, I forget which day it was, within the last week or so, where biotech went up all day long. It was a big retrace rally. And towards the end, last 30 minutes of the day, it began to roll over. Yeah, Zach, that story was in Dave Landry on swing trading. It's called, uh, I think I said, The Bear Has Eyes. Very good. I'm impressed. Somebody actually did their homework. So the reason biotech has been so good, over, especially the last week or so, is because we had a big picture bow tie working here, okay? Market sold off hard out of that bow tie. Well, you can see there's three days where it went pretty much straight down, okay? So trading those lab d shares would have been really profitable over those three days and then the, the day afterwards that that must be it was no that's that's just the opposite of what happened but anyway it sold off pretty hard in the morning and then by the at end of the day it went straight back up so the volatility is there in these shares and they're moving and it's also a big picture top so i'm biased towards the downside in these things you just got to be careful that that every trade you don't think every trade is going to be the mother of all sell-offs. You just have to play like an intraday trade. And one day it might be, but you don't know if it's going to be that day. And again, that's where the ego comes in. And I, believe me, I have a big one. But you can see the bow ties are in downtrend proper order. And if you know how to draw arrows, you could draw an arrow and you can see that biotech looks like it's rolled over. I guess we need to make that arrow blue, a big blue arrow to the downside. So that's why these leverage things have been working if you come back here and try to trade them where it's chopping around chopping around chopping around narrow range i mean this this whole week if you try trading these this whole week in here 
you would have lost, I would imagine, on every single one of those trades. So I know this is working now. It's kind of the church of what's happening now. I know it's not always going to work, but for now, I'm going to play the game while it's working. So I grabbed the last week or so trades. I don't have today's in here. Today I did have losing trade here, but it wasn't by much. But you could see, and I think going back in time, I had a lot more trades that worked out pretty good. But all I'm doing with Lab D, I want I want biotech to go down if I'm buying Lab D. I want it to go up if I'm buying Lab U. But you can see just like simple things like morning breakouts. And in this case, I wrote it all day into the close. I may have gotten a little cute here and played like a breakout from lows, which was probably, you know, shame. But you can see it did accelerate toward the end of the day. The next day, well, actually, you can't see it, but the next day, breakout of the morning range. I hit the profit target pretty quickly, trailed it, trailed a stop higher all day, and then out by the end of the day. And again, morning range breakout, trailing stop the rest of the day out market on close. It doesn't always work this well, but you can see based on the last, what, half a dozen trades here, the last four or five trades at least, you can see why I am getting an affinity, that's the right word, for Lab D. I'm falling in love with Lab D, so I've got to be careful. Same thing with SoxX. Oh, there's the trades right there if you want to take a look at those. Now, I did this trade today. This is the one good thing I did today. And it was kind of a combination of a Russian Russian doll and an ogre. So this was in the Landry list, which is a list of stocks I publish every day as part of my trading service. And it was in a nice accelerating uptrend. If you look at the bars, one bar at a time, and draw, draw a line through as many as possible, you could see that it was not only accelerating in this uptrend, but it was persisting. Kind of a pullback, a little bit of a TKO looking bar in there. And then this morning it gaps lower, not a huge gap, but I know I've got the bigger picture pattern behind me. Uh, especially retail is one of the areas that's actually still doing okay in here. So I figured it was worth a shot as an opening gap reversal. And you could see what I, all I did was I played a breakout of the morning range, okay? And I played it kind of small. And here's the thing, I would have played it bigger had I not been so caught up in my bad behavior. So this one trade could have easily wiped out all my bad behavior if I'd have put on a thousand shares because I was kind of feeling like a thousand shares. But it's like, you know what, Dave? You've got all this bad behavior this morning. You're starting off the day way in the hole. Let me just put on 400 shares and in this one account and let's see what happens. And of course, it turned out to be just a beautiful winning trade. I had a limit order, I took profits at one point and then market on close on the remainder. Actually, it wouldn't let me do market on close. How do you find the breakout? Well, Zach, Zach, you're not paying attention. This is the Landry list, okay? So take the stock off the Landry list. When I was looking at, at my Landry list this morning, I said, oh, that's an opening gap reversal. It was about right here, okay? So I started watching it and I said, all right, well, let me put in a, a, a buy stop order above this opening range here okay and that's how i got long so no i don't scan for breakouts um you can i would recommend that you don't okay and that's where i got into trouble a few days ago it's like uh and i had to put a few trades in the rabbit count uh rabbit count of uh, rabbit column easy for me to say because you can run something like a finvis scan and it'll show you stocks that are up, say, 10% on the day. And a lot of those are just wild and crazy rabbits. And we call them rabbits because I was trading a bunch of those a while back and I had a bunch of positions on. And one of my clients told me I was chasing a lot of rabbits. It's like, oh, he's got a point. Because my equity was going higher and I couldn't figure out what position was, was moving. I had so many going on. That was when things were good, but it was working so well. <laughs> Okay, um, if you want to see a lot of these, oh, Zach, I'm just, I'm, I'm busting your chops, buddy. Don't worry about that. If you want to see a lot of these, almost everything I mentioned, uh, sans the intraday stuff, take a look at the service archives, and I've shortened this to just archives. So it's davelander.com slash archives. 
And if you own a trading service, what I recommend you do is go in and look at the last couple of months in the recent services just to get a feel for how all this works. Okay, George says, so using 50 minute time frame. Yeah, I use five minute bars forever. And as I said a while back, kind of half jokingly, but but it's true. I was trying to make money in E-minis and I was getting chopped around a lot and kind of chasing my own tail. Every move was going to be the mother of all trends and, and I was just going to make all this money. And then one day by complete accident, I changed my five minute chart to a 15 minute chart. And I waited 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 and I waited. And finally around two o'clock, which is three o'clock Eastern, I'm in central time zone. I got a setup. I'm like, well, finally, I said this morning, I just chopped it around all day and I, I bought the peas, you know, rolled them into the cloth. Oh, that, that's a damn good trade. And then the next day, it just kind of chopped around, chopped around, chopped around, and then it began to sell off. I'm like, hey, this is pretty good. I'm going to jump in. Sold it and said, wow, it looks like it's a need a liberal stop. I better put a stop in above the high of the day. And then I put in a trailing stop and then I rolled them down to the close. It's like, well, this is. This is great. I'm 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 getting better at this. I'm staying out of the chop somehow. And then I finally realized I was looking at a 15-minute chart by accident. So from that day forward, I switched from a five-minute chart to a 15-minute chart, and my life has gotten a lot easier. I mean, go back and look at like the now in this case it worked, but let's say I was watching a five-minute chart on GPS, okay. And I just, I, if I would have seen this bar here on a five minute chart, it probably was like, looks like it was going straight to the moon. I probably would have hopped in. And then that would have been followed by these three down bars. I'm calling them bars. It's some funny looking charts. I don't know what they call these charts, but anyway, those three down candles. I'm sure I would have, I would have gotten sucked in and spit out of this trade. I'm almost positive that I would have. You know, what would the world be without hypothetical questions? Stephen Wright, I think, right with a W. Anyway, all right, let's hop into the live charts and let's see. After I started using 10 minute charts, my ogre's performance a lot better. Yeah, too much noise. Yeah, and I try and it's hard sometimes because that one of those trades, one of those lab D trades, I did get in the first 15 minute bar. People's like, well, let's just avoid the first 15 minutes. It's like, because eh, it's a chop fest. I hear you, but if you're looking at a 15 minute chart, and you just got to be really careful because sometimes they 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 take off and they keep going they keep going keep going keep going keep going, then you have to get on a first fifteen minutes of bar. So you must plan on the fly. No, well if you're if you're doing okay, take the stock that we had coming into today that that went to twenty six ninety something and didn't quite trigger. Well, the entry was twenty seven. You know that the night before. By the way, I I think Lauren in here puts in his orders overnight. I don't recommend carrying orders overnight, but I think if you're not disciplined or if you're living in Australia, you don't want to wake up at 2 a.m. and put your orders in, I think longer term you'll do okay by putting in your orders overnight. Occasionally you're going to get a fill and a gap and it's going to suck, yeah, but you know at least you'll get in and you'll be in the position should it continue to, to move in your favor. So all that planning is done ahead of time. On an opening gap reversal, you're looking to play a breakout of the opening range. So you have to let it open. You have to see what it does. And yeah, you do have to do a little planning on the fly. Like the CPE trade, I think I showed last week, it opened up, but fortunately it, it imploded. Now, if I'd have been watching a one minute bar chart or a five minute bar chart, I may have jumped in on the open because it did pop up after I looked at that bar. That 15 minute bar, it did pop up a little bit on the open, and I could have easily triggered into the opening gap reversal. So it's planning on the fly with, with these ogres and things like that, but not is not it's not seat of the pants. Okay. Okay. Lawrence, yeah, in the IPO course, I think that I kind of changed the rule just a slight bit after the IPO course. Uh, and I think I, I have a slide on that somewhere that I added into the course, but uh the question is, with the buy at B, Lawrence taking my IPO course, do you wait for five days before entering or sometimes you enter on the fifth day? Uh, as I often say, uh, if you if it comes public on Monday, you might, if it closes at a new closing high with all the caveats that you've studied, then you would actually buy it on Friday's close, okay? 
Yeah, so that wasn't abundantly clear, I think, in the first uh, in the course, but I've since talked about that quite a bit. And uh, go in and look at the Q&A, uh, which is a little bit newer, or a lot newer, I should say. We, we cover that quite a bit. There's a lot of good stuff, by the way, in the Q&A. And like the opening gap reversals, and I somewhere in there I actually said this because I, I, a client yesterday was like, you know, I saw you spend so much time in these opening gap reversals. It must be something that you do a lot of. It's something that you really need to, that I need to do too. And I'm like, no, not necessarily. It's just something I get a lot of questions on. I want to make sure I get it fleshed out. So that's the that's the Q and A under the member section. But we talk a lot about the opening gap reversals there. So good place to get the speed on it on on that. Easy for me to say. SP 500 doesn't look that bad, right? Had a little bit of an opening gap reversal today, so uh, a little bit. Closed fairly well. It's not too far from all time high, so so those are all good things, right? But if you look at it on a net net basis, we're at 39.09. Okay, where were we back here? We were about 39.10. So we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress in about two months or at least a month and a half. And we really haven't made that much going back a little bit further. This peak isn't significantly higher than that peak. You could argue three drives to a high. I talked about that in yesterday's stock chart show. I'll put that on my website on Friday, March 26th. It'll be on the top of the homepage. By the way, the weekly charts is being recorded and I will put the, I'll put that on top of my homepage too. Uh, some confusion, by the way, between the members area and uh, DaveLander.com. DaveLander.com is the public website. DaveLander.com slash members is the members website. Sometimes people can't find things such as the weekend charts or whatever. Look on the homepage first, and then the all the all the good stuff is behind the members is behind the firewall, as you know. Nasdaq Composite. We had a bow tie down here, a little sloppy, but a bow tie nonetheless. It looks like it's pretty much rolled over now. Again, if it starts going straight back up, or as I often say, one day at a time, starts going straight back up, then all bets are off. But for now, it's below the bow tie moving averages. We could get a crossover back to the downside, which would mean downside proper order. I think if all you did in markets was to mostly stay long when you had uptrend proper order, meaning 10 greater than 20, greater than 30, take a look at the ACP indicator on that, stockcharts.com which is pretty impressive if I say so myself. It's also in Metastock too. It's uh, it's free in both of those platforms for what it's worth. But I think you do pretty good as a general statement. You would certainly do a lot better than fighting the market. Russell 2000, a relative strength base is one of the stronger indices, at least for a while, it was at all time highs just about two weeks ago. But now it has begun to roll over. And you can see the bow ties are starting to roll over. And if it stays down below the 30 for much longer, we will have a crossing here. And that would be a daily signal, but it would still would be a fairly major signal if that occurred. Energies, I'm still bullish on the energies, but they're starting to lose a little steam in here. So maybe Drip might be one of my new dance partners soon in the triple levered shares. But I think that energies are. Eh, they're okay for now, okay? But let's, I'd, I'd like to see them get back to new highs. I'm a little bit more lenient in the energies and the metals because it can be a little choppy, choppier than other areas because they're commodity related or the commodity has a big influence on them. Now, take a look at metals and mining. I've been, bull, I've been bullish on these guys for a while, but now we're well below the moving average. And as you can see, the moving averages have turned down and will likely, likely come together and cross over fairly soon. Gold has been weak for quite a long time, as has silver, but silver's kind of been all over the place. That's the stocks. Let's take a look at a couple other areas in here. Banks still looking pretty darn good. Hard for me to get excited just about banks, but there are a few regional banks that are looking okay in here. I think there's one in tonight's Landry list. Insurance is kind of hanging in there. I know the area not to get too excited about, but they might be a stock or two worthwhile. Now, drugs, on the other hand, look like they could be in trouble. Okay, it looks like they've kind of rolled over in here. Nice little bow tie, nice sell out, off out of a bow tie, nice retrace up, and then they kind of roll back over once again on a micro level today notwithstanding. But you can see 10 less than 20, 20 less than 30. 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. 
Biotech looks a little bit worse, a little bit of a bounce today, but as you can see, downtrend proper order in those moving averages. A couple areas hanging in there, manufacturing and MNC. In fact, MNC is just off of all time highs. What are we long in MNC? I forget. Uh, we have an MNC ARLP. No, that's a metals and mining. I think we have an MNC stock, or at least we did recently in the portfolio. Now, retail had a bow tie down, sold off like a son of a gun. And again, this was in a stock chart show. But then this is why this this is why the short side is so tough. I mean, you feel like you're a genius, you're making all this money, and then you have this sharp retrace right back up. Okay. A couple of more to look at, or let's just take a look at the semis real quick, and then we'll take a look at the transports. Semiconductors look like they've rolled over too, and that's why I've been going after the SOX S mostly. And then based on the volatility, it's been a few days when it's been okay to go in and actually do SOX L. Not that I want to be a counter trend trader counter trend trader but every now and then it's like if it's going up it's going up right all right let's take a look at the transports real quick and then we'll i'll get to your stock picks trade is just hanging in there just off of all-time highs it just looks like a pullback so so far so good there for me there's not enough ex there's not enough sectors to get excited about in this market now i'm not going to Put a put a sign around me, my neck that says bearish, you know, and, and start, uh, you know, henny penny, the sky is falling. But I think there are some signs and signals that we need to pay attention to, and I'm not going to get too excited until we get, say, like a um, TFM 10% system sell in the S&P 500. But I'm certainly going to put on a short or two in the meantime. DIA looks best. Yeah, and that's kind of reflecting what's going on with the transports, what's going on with manufacturing, what's going on with the big cap stocks, what's going on with some of the value areas, so to speak. So the Dow still looks pretty good, okay? But those other areas, not so much, okay? AMD is a short. Yeah, I've been I've been a bear on AMD for a while. Is it AMD or no? It's um, maybe another one I'm thinking about. I had put some one of these, and I think they've since expired. This one, no, AD, is it ADI? ADI was one that I played. Uh, I played some puts. Eh, I don't think it was enough money to write home about. But you know, and that's the problem with the downside sometimes. And and that's it seems like this market in general. It's like it looks like it wants to roll over, but it's just not quite cracking. And I think you got to be careful. As my wife says, you know, you're often right, but early. Is there anything you can do about that? And I'm like, no, babe, I don't think so. Because if, if there was, I'd own the world. But being right, but early, as they said in a big short, it's the same thing, Michael. <laughs> it's the same thing as being wrong. I'm not wrong. I'm just early. So I'm not wrong. I'm just early. Yeah, I think AMD is a little too late to short that. But if you're short, congratulations. Looks good. Okay, George, good, uh, good call on that one. OCG, OCG, I like. I did play this one the other day. This was one of those rabbits, truth be told. <laughs> I did play it. Um, but yeah, I think it looks pretty good. I, I do. Uh, it's a little bit on the extreme side. And, and I, I saw it in my scans tonight. And I I was going to put it in Landry List. I think I might have stopped short of doing that or pulled it out, one or the other, simply because it's so extreme, okay? And I was explaining the Landry list to somebody yesterday. Sometimes it's something in the list might be more volatile than I would want to put as an official recommendations, but but I might go in and trade it personally because I'm willing to take risk. Whereas it could be kind of dangerous to put everybody through all that risk. Okay. Not that the positions I recommend aren't risk risky. But yeah, you had a little open gap reversal there. That was kind of nice. Nobody uh, nobody called me to tell me about that. So thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm half kidding. But yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, dangerous 267. I mean, that's crazy. So be really careful on that one. I would almost treat that one as like a an intraday type of thing. I thought, well, that's from an hour ago. How much is something? Oh, McAvee was that M M C F E? Yeah, this looks okay. Um, I was long this a while back. I forget what the pattern was. I think it was right here on a new closing high. That's a buy a D right there. And it's kind of interesting. It sold off for a long time, got its act together, and took off. That's one of my favorite buy at these. Well, actually, my favorite one is close on Friday, like you were asking earlier. Uh, but that looks okay. My only concern, now it's an IPO, so I'm a little bit more lenient. 
but it has pulled all the way back to its prior little breakout in here, but it looks okay, okay? I, I, I wouldn't personally go out and buy that stock, but I can't fault you for picking that. If the conditions were a little better, it might be worth a shot, especially since it's still an IPO. DAC, EAC. Okay, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bull on the shippers right now. As you know, we have a shipper in the, uh, I like the shipper that we have in the Landry list tonight better. Uh, this is, could use a little bit more pullback. I mean, if you got long today, that's great. It actually needs a little more pullback, but I think good eye on that one, okay? Uh, Zach, I'm not going to be able to go through all that tonight since we're running low on time. But uh, let, bring that up. Ask about that in a Facebook group. I'll, I'll take a look at it there for you. I'd be happy to do. Zach's got a portfolio of stocks he wants to talk about. Yeah, uh, VIAC, uh, too much of a pullback. Chris, first thing you want to look at here, and I was going to play an open and gap reversal. See, I did a shame. I did some shame behavior here. <laughs> I was going to play the open and gap reversal here. Luckily, I didn't trigger in. I actually shorted some. And just for S and Gs, because it looked like it was really imploding, I shorted some when it began to implode, and I immediately covered, and I had a $20 loss, and then I watched the damn thing drop 10 bucks, and uh, that's that's a shame trade. So, but yeah, the gap down, anything that's got a big gap down, unless it's commodity related, then I would pass. Okay, F and B. FNB looks okay. A lot of regional banks look kind of like this. It could probably use a little bit more pullback, but sometimes these regionals don't pull back that much. So yeah, I'll give you a, um, almost a high five on that one. You know, that's the, the market we're in now. We're gonna have to look at things like um, regional banks and all. This would almost made the land your list tonight, but I don't like the little, even though it's way up here, I just don't like the gap in the setup. This stock, it's imploded so much, but James, yeah, it looks okay. It would be a Landry Light pullback with a 30 EMA and boy, quite a trend there. Um, I think it'd be okay if it, you know, maybe an opening gap reversal would be something fun to play on that one. But I would pass based on that gap down. And it does, even though it's a nice pullback, it does look like it's broken a little bit. Now, maybe I'm letting a little bit of my bearishness sneak in on me. But uh, I think it's kind of broken. I don't like, again, I don't like the gap down up here. So I would pass on that one. Okay, I'm pretty much out of time. I need to go ahead and wrap things up tonight. Just, But I appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I guess technically we ran about a, a half an hour long. Uh, everybody uh, have a great weekend. We'll talk again. And then I'll see you guys, most of you guys, uh, girls that are here tonight, I'll see you in the Facebook group.